authority? Where does it come from? How do we use it? On our second Sunday at the lake, we encounter a story about authority. Now, if you were here last Sunday, you'll realize that this is a different version of the calling of the disciples than the way Luke tells it. In Matthew's story, Jesus walks along the shoreline. He encounters two brothers, Simon and Andrew. He says, follow me. They drop their nets, and they follow him. A similar situation happens with brothers James and John. They leave their father in the boat to run the fishing business by himself. Why do they follow? Some commentators posit that these men already had a relationship with Jesus. And so while we're given the decision moment, this has actually been a long process of discernment. It's quite possible. But it could also be spontaneous. Was fishing boring? Too many fishermen? Not enough fish? Were James and John not really that enthused about inheriting the family business in the first place, and this was a new and different opportunity? We don't know exactly why they follow, but what we do know is we are looking at a moment when these men are wrestling with a question of what makes their life worth living. They're wrestling with that primary question about how they will order their days. And something in this invitation of Jesus gives them a vision for life that is something greater than what they could create for themselves or what they had inherited from their tradition, family, or custom. This relates to where authority comes from. Uh, the word authority comes from the same Latin root where we get the word author. So I want us to think this morning of authority not as a power over someone or something, but to think about who or what is writing the story of your life. Who holds the pen to tell the tale of your existence? Perhaps Simon and Andrew James and John had been having their stories written by their own tradition, and they found them stale and cliche. Maybe they were stories that were just being handed to them by their family, and they found that they were insufficient and inadequate. Or maybe they tried to take the pen and write their own life's story for themselves but they found that their sentence structure was poor, their vocabulary elementary, their narrative structure clunky. Jesus says, follow me. In a way, he says, give me the pen to write the story of your life. It will become part of my story too. This is the decision point. Will they accept and embrace the authority of God upon their lives and the responsibilities that come with it? To a contemporary audience, uh, Yale professors Miroslav Wolf, Matthew Crozman, and Ryan McAnally Lenz address this idea of authority and responsibility in their book, Life Worth Living, A Guide to What Matters Most. They say, if we want to avoid the sense that the pivotal moments of our lives are merely preferred selections off the menu of life. We'll need to come to terms with the fact that the choices, our choices alone can't be the ultimate source of our responsibility. We have a conscience, and we no doubt ought to pay good attention to it. But to really do its job, this conscience must be, internalized, be an internalized impression of some non-arbitrary and quite possibly external source of our responsibility. Simon and Andrew, James and John, hear the call of Jesus as the external responsibility for their life. And Jesus doesn't bind them. He frees them. They drop their nets and follow. 
Now, Jesus reveals something in this story about how we use authority. Up to this point in the story, it's pretty clear that Jesus understands himself as a sage, someone who dispenses wisdom and knowledge and a way of engaging the world. But unlike other sages at the time of Jesus, these other sages would put out their ideas, their thoughts, and then people would hear them and come seeking the sage. You can hear the hierarchy here, right? In the positional arrangement, the student comes to the sage to learn. The sage dispenses wisdom and information. The student must seek the teacher. But in the case of Jesus, Jesus the sage goes out to recruit his followers. As Elizabeth, uh, Nancy Elizabeth Bedford puts it, Jesus does not call the four fishermen to sit at his feet, but rather to follow in his footsteps. That's a different power dynamic. Walk alongside me. Learn not by absorbing and receiving, but by participating and reflecting. The sage not over the student, but part of the learning with the student. Relational authority. Now, there's no doubt that Jesus is the teacher. The disciples call him teacher throughout his entire ministry, but he is the teacher who comes with, walks alongside, loves, and cares. The way of Jesus is the way of authority with. To call ourselves Christians, then, is to admit that we are giving the pen of our life over to the authorship of God and that we are then exercising the responsibilities that come with the one who crafts the text. We don't write our own story. And that can sound troubling, because it sounds like we're then just a character in someone else's story, um, that we're maybe just marionettes at the whims of the puppeteer. But that's where it's important to remember that the one who exercises authority here, God, isn't one who sits over, but one who comes alongside, one who understands, one who accompanies. God understands, relates to, receives, corrects, and challenges us into this way of holy life. And so our call becomes adding others to the story along the journey as we exercise our secondary authority in the same way that God, the author of our life, uses God's authority and gives us these responsibilities. And so after feeling immediately trepidatious, once you find out God is going to go with you on this journey, as God writes the story of your life, that can sound really exciting. Wow, we're on this adventure with God. Um, but some of us have been reading Eric Peterson's book, Wade in the Water, this summer. And Peterson reminds us that the life of discipleship is not just one of comfort and assurance. He actually offers some criticism of the ways that we love the cozy and serene baptisms of infants in our tradition because it only points to the assurance and the comfort. He contrasts that with the practice of infant baptism in the Orthodox Church, where the child, naked, is plunged, submerged in the cold water three times, ensuring that there will be wailing and crying. Just as we cry as a sign of life when we come out of the womb of our mother, so we cry with new life as we come out of the womb of our baptism. Peterson reflects, like birthing, the transition to a new life in Christ is fraught with discomfort and even pain. Baptism provides necessary shock value to disciples by initiating them into a life of Christ, a life of rebirthing surprises, both pleasant and painful, yet always good. The disciples will learn, and we will read in future weeks, that this life of Jesus alongside us as our authority drives us into places and situations we would never select for ourselves. Now today, 
uh, we commissioned our middle schoolers. Nine of them are heading to a conference at Massanetta Springs this coming week with two adults in tow. They never would have gone to this camp if Jesus had not called those first disciples. And they are going because that voice is still speaking, going to have their ears tuned to listen for that voice, to give the pen of their life into the authorship of God's hand, the one who walks and lives alongside them. And in a few moments, we're going to do something unique. We're going to ordain and install elders and deacons into positions of authority in the life of our church. Presbyterians are the only Christian expression that endow this level of both organizational and spiritual leadership to called leaders within the congregation and not the clergy. The vows that they take, the laying on of hands, these rituals, they are the same questions, the same rituals that pastors receive. Decisions are made collectively as we together listen to how God is writing our story and how we exercise our responsibility toward the divine will. These men and women today are dropping their nets of control and comfort to follow the sage who walks with us. I believe this is the most important calling of your life, that all your other responsibilities and expectations actually come from this principal identity as a disciple of Jesus called into leadership within the Christian community. Everything flows from the waters of grace. I believe this, of course, because it talks about it in the Bible. And, and theology, but I also believe it because of uh, uh, experience. I remember on days like this, uh, the day that I was ordained into ministry, um, and those vows that I answered in the hands that were laid on me, as part of that service, the minister is charged for the work of ministry in the church, and you're invited to invite someone to issue that charge. Um, I asked my Aunt Sharon Patton to do that. She is a, a Presbyterian elder. She's my Sunday school teacher as a child, someone who loves the scriptures, cares deeply about the church. I want to share some of what she said in the charge to me that day. I charge you to listen to others, particularly listen to those in your congregation. Remember, as Rachel, her daughter and my cousin, told you once as a child, you are not the boss of their minds. God is. Some of the members have studied the scriptures and walked with the Lord since before you were born. They are wise servants of the Lord, and God speaks to them just as he will surely speak to you. Be discerning. But listen to their ideas and take their advice to heart. Accept their praise and occasional reproof with a gentle and malleable spirit. Now, I had to go back and look up that charge this week so that I could read it to you verbatim, but the idea was planted, etched into my soul on that day. And the wisdom of those words have been repeated in the life of ministry for me time and time again. Because I, like I imagine some of you, have this desire to wrench the pen out of God's hand to be the author of my own life, but not only that, but to be able to tell you how your story ought to be authored by God as well. To be the sage who sits above the student. But if we stand on the shoreline with the sand in our toes and the net in our weathered hands 
and the sun on our leather necks. And we hear the call, follow me. A whole new way of life begins. Jesus takes the pen to write the story. He walks with us even as he instructs and teaches. And he equips and empowers us for the journey together. Just as Simon and Andrew, James and John had each other as they exercised their responsibilities for discipleship. To discern, to heed, to praise, and reprove. With so much grandstanding, self-promotion, and demagoguery around us day by day, posing as authority, what a gift it is to have one who can author our life, who knows what really is life. One who goes with us, one who gives us others to share the responsibility, to challenge us into new spaces and environments that we would never write for ourselves, to form us into a community who reveals the very kingdom of heaven to the world. Amen.